When you find Ezra 7, starting with the first verse, say amen. Amen. Now after these things in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra, the son of Sariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Hilkali, the son of Shalom, the son of Zadok, the son of Ahitab, the son of Amariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Maroth, the son of Zeraiha, the son of Uzai, the son of Buckeye, hey, Buckeye, the son of Abishua, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the chief priest. This Ezra went up from Babylon, and he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given, and the king granted him all his request, according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. And there went up some of the children of Israel, and the priests and the Levites, and the singers, and the porters, and the Nethanims unto Jerusalem, in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. And he came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. For upon the first day of the first month began he to go up from Babylon, and on the first day of the fifth month came he to Jerusalem, according to the good hand of his God upon him. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it, and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. Let us pray. Father, we come before you one more time this evening to ask for your blessing to be upon the reading and preaching of your word. Lord, there is nothing in us or about us that makes us fit for this task Lord, it is your spirit that enables. So, Lord, we pray for your help. We pray for your grace. We pray that those that hear tonight would be encouraged and lifted up in their faith. We give you glory through your Son, Jesus Christ, by whom we have access through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Now, if you didn't get a real good taste for what the book of Ezra was in this short reading, um, then there's some other chapters I could give to you. But you begin to get an idea that Ezra is certainly a historical document. I've already shared that it is interesting that the book that bears this prophet's name does not see the prophet on the scene does not talk about him, mention him, until we are in the seventh chapter. You don't see that a whole lot in literary works, do you? And so the first six chapters, we have a history that has been given that talks about how the people of Israel had been released from Babylonian captivity and had been sent back to Israel. And a remnant did go, and and their task was to rebuild the temple. And these first chapters, these first six chapters, details the difficulty that they had in doing so. However, as we talked about in the last time we visited this book, we heard about how God used his prophets to preach to the people and to to prod them to keep going forward with building the temple instead of simply worrying about their own security and their own housing, to, to think of the things of God first. As we mentioned at the very end of this morning's sermon, to seek the kingdom of God first and everything else shall be added unto that. But now we come into Ezra chapter 7, and so you might be wondering, what is the time frame? What is the changes that has taken place between chapter 6 and chapter 7? Well, we know that the temple has been finished and dedicated, and then Ezra shows up probably around 60-some years later. There's quite a bit of time that takes place between chapter 6 and chapter 7. 
When chapter 7 comes along, we have a second remnant of Israel who is given the authority to return by King Artaxerxes. And there they go back, and the purpose of this group was not to rebuild the temple. It was already done. But this purpose was to establish the law, to reestablish true worship. Because somewhere along the lines, we will find it when we read further past this, that the people had given, had, had given themselves over to pagan wives and allowed false worship practices to creep back into Israel. The very first thing that sent them into exile in the first place creeped in. And Ezra's job was to come in, teach the word of God, so that the people could remain separate in their faith, in their practices from the other nations that were around him. But if there is one thing over this chapter, we read in chapter 7, I read to you the introduction to, to uh, uh, Ezra, who he is. The remainder part of this chapter details the letter that author authorizes him to do it. Chapter 8 will begin with a list of names of all the families, the heads of the families that returned with Ezra from this, in this second remnant. And then it will talk about um, what he was wanting to do. It talks about an incredible step of faith that Ezra had to do to get to Jerusalem. But if there is one thing that, that in this introduction to Ezra's life, this man of God, it is found there in verses 9 and 10. If you read there, it says, For upon the first day of the first month began he to go up from Babylon... And on the first day of the fifth month came he to Jerusalem. Read this line here. According to the good hand of his God upon him. This chapter and the next chapter, you will see that phrase. According to the good hand of his God upon him several times. Can you have the testimony? Do you have the testimony that the good hand of the Lord is upon your life? That God's hand is touching your life and that he is blessing your life. That's, a, that's an amazing thing to have the hand of God upon your life, isn't it? What a testimony to see that. Because we know what was done, not just throughout the whole Bible by the hand of God throughout it. But we can simply look at the life of Jesus and look at how, the, how he touched people's lives and changed people's lives simply by touching them. He would come to the lepers. I feel, I feel good this evening thinking about this. He came to lepers. And by the law and by the nature of the disease, if you touched them, you would become unclean. You would become filled with the disease. It was communicable. It would transfer to you. But when he touched the lepers, his holiness, his power, his virtue transferred to them and they were made whole. They were cleansed. He would come and he would see dead bodies and the dead, the decay, was something that they knew if you touched it, it would transfer to you. But he would touch it and he would give them new life. Aren't you thankful for the hand of the Lord that came upon your life when you were dead and in decay of sin and he touched you? Oh, he touched me. Oh, he touched me. And he changed my life. He brought me out from being a sinner. He brought me and made me a child of God when he touched my life. I'm thankful that the good hand of his God uh, is upon us. I'm thankful that we can still have his touch, that we can still feel him in our life. And not only does he do miraculous things uh, when we need it by the touch of his hands, I feel his guiding touch. As I have to make decisions, as I have to go throughout my daily life, I feel his hand leading me. I feel his hand protecting me all throughout my life. Do you have the testimony? Do you have the desire to have the good hand of our God upon you? Do you seek God's blessing or do you just want God's blessing? So I wrote that down for my notes tonight. I, I was thinking along the lines of those who simply want to have the name Christian, simply want the benefits of being a Christian, the blessings, simply want the good hand of the Lord upon them, but don't want to put 
anything to it. They don't want their life to be changed. They don't want to be troubled. They want, don't want to go through persecution. They don't want to go through peril. But the Bible tells us that the good hand of the Lord was upon Ezra because of his life. Look, look at verse 10. After in verse 9 it says, according to the good hand of his God upon him, it uses the word for, because, since, are all transitional words that would fit in there. For Ezra had what? Prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. Ezra prepared his heart. He wanted God's hand upon his life and so he sought God's hand upon his life. He wanted it and he looked for it and he found it. Ask and it shall be answered to you, not given to you. Knock and it will be opened to you. Seek and you shall find it. We Look for God's blessing. We'll find God's blessing when we give our life to Him. And so we've got to be seeking, not just expecting handouts. We, 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 expect, we expect life to be easy, right? So many people, um, the religion of, uh, of TBN and different things like that, the religion of those preachers is that, that all you got to do is believe it and you can have it. And that's not true. The Bible talks about how the righteous will suffer persecution. There is, we are to expect difficulty and we are to expect challenge in our life. And we are called to have faith and push through those things. So are you seeking God's blessing? Are you seeking God's kingdom? Or are you simply just wanting it tonight? Make up the mind. Understand where you are at tonight. Are you looking at yourself and saying, well, I should be, I've done all these things and I should be getting these blessings or uh, who I am or who my parents are or, or what I've given to the church? No, you need to seek God. Look at how Ezra sought God. He studied God's word. He prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. So what do you need? In order to have the hand of the Lord upon you, you need to seek him. But how do we seek him? You start at the beginning. You start at the foundation, the bedrock. And that is through God's word. Study of God's word is the foundation of spiritual blessing. First part of that verse, verse 10. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it. But study of God's word is also the foundation of being able to teach and evangelize others. Look at the second part of verse 10. And to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. He needed God's blessings to do both. You can memorize God's word, you can, you can do that, but if you do not have your heart prepared and made right, it's not going to be any, to have any avail. And you, if you do not have the Spirit of God, God's hand upon your life when you're preaching, when you're try, attempting to preach or attempting to teach, you will do that till you're blue in the face, but no lives will be transformed. But it starts with that. We talk about prayer and about going to church. And yes, those fall into place, but they fall into place on top of God's word. You pray to God and you know how to pray to God, how to address God, what to ask him and not to ask amiss. Because you have studied God, you have learned about God and what God has said about himself through his word. You go to church and you worship God in spirit and in truth. And the only way you can worship God in spirit and in truth is if you have learned and read and founded yourself on the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God and which is the bedrock of truth, the word of God. 
We've got to have a heart and desire for this. You will not grow in your Christian walk if you are not reading your Bible daily, if you are not taking it in, meditating upon it. And as it says here, not only to seek the law of the Lord, but to do it. You've got to make it applicable to your life. You've got to do it. I think it's good preaching. Is your heart prepared to seek the Lord through his word? You're not going to find him in any other way. You're not going to find him in a way that makes sense. You, you can see God. We can look at Psalm 19, a beautiful, beautiful psalm. Uh, in fact, let's, let's, let's turn there. Turn with me to Psalm 19. I wasn't planning on looking at this, but I want to show you something. David talks about it. You can see God everywhere. But if you really want to learn God and worship God and, and to do what we talked about this morning and actually know God, not just about God, you need the word. Look here, first six verses, he talks about God in nature. He says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his, show of his handiwork. Day unto day utter of speech and night unto night show of knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. Well, we see God in nature. The heavens declare it. But if you want to know God's name, who he is like, what his will is for our life. You've got to keep reading this same psalm. And David teaches us about it. He says, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, much, much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. You can know that there is a God. You can know some facts about the nature of God by looking at the Grand Canyon or looking at the ocean. But until you actually pick up the word of God, you will not know who he is, his name, what he is like, and what it you must do in order to be saved. You've got to have the word of God as the foundation for your life. We was interviewing a minister yesterday who was coming in from the Nazarene church into the Christian Baptist, and we brought it up even in that. We have our bylaws that we govern our church here, but we take those bylaws from the Word of God. We do not use them to supersede God's Word. God is the authority, the sole authority, the sole reference of our life. We come to the Word of God, and if there is anything that is going on in this church or anything going on in our community and or in our nation or even in our individual lives that is contrary to the Word of God, God's word stands over top of that and we've got to fall underneath what God has said. So Ezra had God's hand on him because he didn't stand above God's word but he sat under God's word. He loved it. He learned it. He sought God through it and it wasn't just to go into him. He did that so he could share it with others. I get that from Ezra 7. If you want God's hand on your life, you've got to seek him through his word. But also you've got to realize that this world is still God's world. Even though there is so much sin in it, this is God's world, and God can do what he wants to with this world. Look at chapter 7, verse 27. We didn't read this yet, but go with me. 
As I said, Ezra recounts the letter that was given to him by Artaxerxes, King Artaxerxes, that allowed them to go to the land of Israel to return. And at the end of this chapter, Ezra goes into what I would call a praise break. He, he is just so overwhelmed. He read this letter again, and he's just amazed. I can't believe King Artaxerxes is letting us do this. He is so amazed, and so he starts to praise God in verse 27 and 28. He says, Blessed be the Lord God of our fathers, which have put such a thing as this in the king's heart to beautify the house of the Lord which is in Jerusalem and hath extended mercy unto me before the king and his counselors and before all the king's mighty princes. And I was strengthened as the hand of the Lord my God was upon me and I gathered together out of Israel chief men to go up with me. He remembers all the difficulty the previous generation had with going back to Israel and rebuilding the temple. How they tried, how the surrounding nations tried to, to come in and, 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 and mess it up and try to, to stop the work. And, and for a time being, they were successful until God's prophets stood up and, and, and got the ball rolling again. He remembers the difficulty of the people in that surrounding nation and the hatred they had still towards Israel. And now that King Artaxerxes, almost seemingly out of the blue, picked out Ezra and said, you can go do this. You've talked about it. You've, you've, you've mentioned Israel, how you want to go do this. Now go do this. Whatever is in your heart, go do it, he said. And he was able to go, and he was just so thankful. And he gave praise to God that God is in charge. I don't care who's in Washington. I don't care who's in the United Nations. God's still in charge. Amen. Not a single one of us can impeach him. Not a single one of us can usurp the throne from him. There's not going to be a big enough revolt against him. Sin, pe the world seems like it's in an upheaval against God, but it doesn't matter how many people come against him, he's still in charge. Right. Oh, and get this. The world will do that at the end of time. The Bible tells us in the book of Revelation that there will be a grand army that is gathered all around the mountains and in the plains. And Jesus, he will lead forth the saints of God robed in white. And Jesus himself will be in the front and he will be on a white horse and his name will be on his thigh. And it says that a sharp sword proceeds from his mouth. You know what that is? The word of God. And so simply as that sword goes out of his mouth, as the word goes out of his mouth, the enemy armies are cut asunder. And it says that the blood and all that was up to the horse's bridles. He did that by his word. You think we should still learn his word? Amen. But in this world, you got to realize that it's God's still. There's an old song. I love listening to it. We have a kid's version of it that the kids listen to. Um, and, and, and I think it's a good one. It's called This Is, this, this is My Father's World. And, and even though it's out in sin, this is still God's world and he still has his way. And nothing is happening that surprises him and catches him off guard. So if you want God's hand on your life, you've got to submit. Because if this world in all of it is under his authority... Your life must also be under his authority and give him praise. But lastly, there's something I want to bring to your attention as we look at these chapters where we are introduced to Ezra. He's a man who is seeking God through his word. He is a man who is submitted to God's work in his life. And that's why we see God's hand upon him. But why else is God's hand upon him? Because he is a man of faith. Go to chapter 8. This is as they are making the journey. They'll, they'll arrive by the end of chapter 8, we'll read. But it's a perilous journey. He knows it. And basically, as we read here, Artaxerxes said, Ezra... Do you and your company of Israelites on your way to Jerusalem want a um, 
band of soldiers to protect you? Because we know that recently and previously you all have had trouble with the neighboring nations. Do you want some soldiers to protect you? And apparently Ezra said no. God's hand has placed it on us to do this work. We don't need any protection. That's faith, right? But I love this. Do you ever struggle with faith? I mean, I'm up here right now telling you all how to have the hand of God on your life. And realizing that I've got, when I point finger at you, I've got three fingers pointing back at myself. I've got to go live this too. And Ezra said, God's hand will be on us. But look what happens. He, 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 he worries a little bit. He struggles, but he's going to take God. So read, read here. Verse 21, Ezra 8, 21. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahava, that we might afflict ourselves before our God to seek of him a right way for us and for our little ones and for all our substance. For I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way, because we had spoken unto the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him. But his power and his wrath is against all them that forsake him. So we fasted and besought our God for this, and he was entreated of us. He stepped out and said, I've already boasted about my God, about him protecting us. Now I've got to actually believe it and live like that. That's faith. Faith is living as though the promises of God are sure. But now, go down to verse 30. Go down to verse 30. So took the priests and the Levites the weight of the silver and the gold and the vessels to bring them to Jerusalem unto the house of our God. Then we departed from the river of Ahava on the twelfth day of the first month to go to Jerusalem. And the hand of our God was upon us. And he delivered us from the hand of the enemy and of such as lay in wait by the way. And we came to Jerusalem. And abode there three days. And we came to Jerusalem. They made it. They stepped out on faith. And theirs was that the enemy would not touch them. And God delivered. And they made it to Jerusalem. They stepped out on faith. When's the last time you really stepped out on faith? Faith is not being able to simply go out and do something that... You know you have done over and over before and again under your own ability. Faith is understanding that God does things for us that we are not able to do for ourselves. I can't save myself. I can't deliver myself from sin. And so I have to have faith, belief, trust that what Jesus Christ did on the cross and when he rose from the dead, that it is sufficient for my salvation. That is faith. But think of other steps of faith that you do in your life. Talking and sharing your testimony with somebody that you're afraid of. Maybe having the idea, I'm not a good talker. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not eloquent in speech. I don't have enough of this memorized. But I feel God calling me to do it. And even though I know I do not have the ability, I will have faith in God to do the work through me. Think of faith. Small congregation of about 60 to maybe 100 people at the time in 1995 saying, Oh God, we want to build a church on 4185 Parsons Avenue and we want to do it without taking a loan from the bank. We're all just a, 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 a bunch of blue-collar workers. God, we feel you calling us to do that, and everybody around us is saying that you can't do it. The building that we're wanting to build is going to cost millions of dollars. It's going to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars if it's cheaper. God, how are you going to help us do this? And you did it. You remember that? You remember those years, so, those of you that went through that? And you, and you started building this church and you sold old Woodrow and worshipped in the basement of the parsonage for a year? That's faith. I mean, at any moment, the work could have stopped. But you had faith in God 
to do something that was utterly crazy for one thing and seemed out there and didn't make sense to a lot of people looking in, but you had faith and God blessed. His hand was upon that work. What step of faith have you taken? What has he called you to do in your life? Maybe it's giving something. Maybe it's doing a new work. Maybe it's taking up a new ministry. Speaking to that person that you know that God has placed in your life to witness to. What step of faith do you need to do? See, when you do that and you step out on faith, just like Ezra say, can say, the good hand of the Lord was upon me. Because if it wasn't for me, I would have fall, fallen on my face. But his hand was there holding me, guiding me. The good hand of the Lord of, of our God can be upon us if we seek him through his word. We submit completely to him in everything. And we trust him in faith and step out on faith no matter what he's called us to do. As we stand to pray, any of those three areas that you need to come and pray about?